This week on the Computer Chronicles, Smart TV. Want to download data at six megabytes per minute? We'll show you how by plugging your TV into your PC. You've heard about the cable modem. Now, thanks to Hewlett Packard and Intel, you can see it in action. Windows 95, that's old stuff. Meet David, the new operating system for digital TV, set-top boxes, and video on demand. And finally, high-quality audio and video in sync on a PC. Thanks to MPEG-2 and S3, we'll show you how it works. On Net News, Giles takes us on a tour of Convergence websites, plus this week's computer news and a cool new program that lets you create multimedia family albums. All this and more coming up next on the Computer Chronicles. Computer Chronicles is made possible in part by Hewlett Packard Personal Computers, developing PCs for business. The Computer Chronicles is also made possible by the Software Publishers Association, providers of educational materials to help manage software. Don't copy that floppy. Hi, and welcome to the Computer Chronicles. I'm Stuart Chaffe. While you struggle to slowly download big computer files on a phone line from your favorite cyber site, a gigantic potential data highway is sitting right in your home now, underutilized. It's called your TV antenna. And with a neat new gadget called Molokai, you can now use the broad bandwidth of a TV receiver to dump tons of data onto your PC. Hi, Wayne. Okay, this is the gadget, I guess, and basically it's just an ISO board that you slip into a PC slot. It's an ISO board. It goes right into your PC, and it's made up really of just two chips here. These are the two primary things on the board. Uh, it also has a way to deliver video into it and a way to deliver video out of it. So it's like a normal modem card, except instead of a phone line going in, it's a TV signal. Going That's in. correct. And this particular one doesn't have a tuner in it, but it also could have a tuner wow. on board, in which case we could deliver a regular RF signal right to the back of it. All right, so show me what the interface looks like. Okay, this is what the screen you might see if you first uh, looked into the package. And really all this does is allow a consumer to decide how they want to interact with the data. And basically they've got three choices. Download everything that's on at a given point. Don't download anything. or Download things selectively as you... All right, now, now this assumes that some TV station or several TV stations or networks are feeding data with their TV shows, right? That's absolutely correct. It assumes that there is something that's coming down at all times, whether you can see it or whether it's invisible. And what's the thing at the bottom? The thing at the bottom is just a way that we can actually demarcate our hard drive so that we don't download too much data. Okay, so I can say I want so much of my hard drive dedicated to automatically picking up stuff That's the correct. TV. And once you get to a certain point, you get near that point, you'll start getting warning messages that say to you, hey, you've got a little bit too much data in here now. Do you want to accept any more packages right, so or how not? Do I, how do I know what's coming down? Well, here's a good way to find out. Here's a data guide that we've got. You pick a network, in this case NBC. We go ahead and click on it. We click a particular show. There's a show. Here's some data that's coming down. We click on that. That puts it on our what's coming list. And now we have, in fact, created uh, a list of things that we want to come down. In this case, a Seinfeld interactive tour. So while I was watching Seinfeld, the TV program, I was, simul I was simultaneously feeding data into my PC that might have photos or backgrounds on Jerry and that kind of stuff. That's correct. In this example, we wouldn't actually see the data. Yeah. It would be coming down in the vertical blanking interval, so we wouldn't right, now, see it. Show me the example of really dumping lots of software real fast using TV. Okay, here's a good example. Now I'm just going to roll this tape right here. And we're store right now we're going to show you a great product from Microsoft called Microsoft Publisher. It is item number 3337 here on the So this PC is like a kind of QVC of example you're showing where you would be selling and delivering the software electronically. That's correct. And you can see now, you're going to see he's showing off the product here. He's giving you a special price on the product. You're also going to see, if you come over to the other screen, you're going to see that we've already got messages that say, by the way, consumer, there's something coming down in a very short amount of time. So some data message was hidden in the video signal already. That's correct. And flyers and brochures and, and cards. Just a second. After Greg gets done showing us around the product itself, he's now going to actually, once we've got a consumer interested in this, he's going to be able to deliver a demo version of that software very, very shortly. And this is a selling example, but I mean, it doesn't have to be in a selling model, right? I mean, we could be sending software right now during Computer Chronicles. That's correct. Right now. And here's a good example of what the software actually looks like. These, no that black and white stuff coming down is data. So that's what data looks like when it's part of the TV signal. That's right. All right, now how do I know over here on my PC something's happening? Well, you can look right up here on the yellow bar, and you can see that we're 65, 66% uh, you know, downloaded now. We can see that we're receiving data over here in the, with the green arrow. And when it's over, we'll be all set. I'm just going to go ahead and stop that tape. 
uh, and we can actually come in here now and look at what's here. And we, in fact, have Microsoft Publisher Demo. We can open that thing up, and it will decompress because it does come in compressed. And now we can play with that software for as long as we want. So in those 15 seconds, you fed me this whole demo copy of Publisher, which was how big a file? That's correct. It was almost a 4-megabyte file. Wow. And it's here on my hard drive, and I cannot go play with it. That's absolutely right. Uh, and in fact, because we can send down uh, you know, the full demo version, we can also send down a full working version of the software also in a locked format and actually have a transaction. That is really cool. Wayne, thank you very much. All right, this trend towards smart TVs and multimedia PCs is called convergence, the merging of the functionality of our two favorite appliances. To catch up on the latest in the field of smart TV, we visited Convergence 95, a smart TV developers conference held a few weeks ago in San Jose, California. Walk along an aisle at the Convergence 95 Expo and you may feel like you've gone back in time to a computer show of the early 1980s. There are plenty of small stands with clever homegrown products and a sense that we are watching the birth of a new industry. The difference is that a lot of major players are showing interest and they are making plans today. We want to have a, a layered experience where there's many different types of programming available, but you can get into it at whatever depth you would like to and, and find the kind of materials that you're interested in so you'll be able to surf through the video that you want to see uh, and make choice and control decisions to be able to view the type of program you want to view. On the hardware side, Philips, Divicom, and Stellar were showing their set-top boxes the most likely devices for capturing and processing the two-way cable data. Oracle demonstrated its media objects authoring tools, delivering real-time audio and video from, of course, the Oracle Media Server. Wink Communications promoted what they termed simple interactivity using the Wink Engine, a software interpreter that fits into any set-top box or monitor. The question of what qualifies as interactive was answered differently by different parties. In many cases, it will start with simple broadcast services that are only lightly interactive. Let's say a program guide or a, a TV guide uh, type of uh, on-screen thing. The, the next stage is where you can actually start to download real applications and have some backstream communication up to a video server or to the network. And then, once you have that, really the, the world is wide open. The, the third profile, you might say, is when you have a symmetrical network where your set-top box could have a video encoder as well as a video decoder. One of the cleverest peripherals on display was the PCMCIA adapter for set-top boxes from SystemSoft. The cards can hold additional memory, station programming preferences, printer connectors, and self-contained applications. For the Computer Chronicles, I'm Giles Bateman. David is an acronym for Digital Audio Video Interactive Decoder, and it's the name of the emerging standard operating system for interactive TV. David was created by a company called Microware. Arthur, you're from Microware. Tell me about David. Why is this so important? Well, it's important because there's a need for a common target, a common standard right now, and an open standard for developers, specifically application developers and content providers, to start creating applications and services for interactive television networks. And David is built on OS 9, basically, David right? is a ba built on Microware's OS 9 real-time operating system, very stable, very mature, and it brings that sense of security and mission-critical kind of efficiency mm -hmm. to consumer electronic devices. Okay, let's talk about the setup. So what do we have <clears throat> right here? Okay, what we have here is a digital interactive decoder. What some people call a set-top box. Right, in this case it's a set-bottom box okay. uh, from one of our uh, licensees. And there is a telephone line attached somewhere out there. In this case, this is just a demo to a PC. Okay, the computer's not important right now. That right. would be back at a TV station Exactly. Somewhere. All I have at home is my TV set and my set-top box. Right. And this is going to receive MPEG-encoded digital audio and video from some kind of service. So this is digital TV coming to me on a phone line from my phone company. Presumably. Exactly. All right, what are my choices here? Uh, the choices here are, for example, we've, we have uh, some applications that show, uh, in the first case, some movies on demand. Mm -hmm. And here uh, you, could, you can flip through this. So this is video on demand that we've heard about. Absolutely. And in the second case, we have uh, something a bit more to the home, in this case a home buyer's guide. And uh, in the home buyer's guide, you can choose uh, So that was sort of multimedia real estate section. Absolutely. New developments. You can try okay. to, uh, uh, if, you, if you need to buy some kind of house okay. somewhere. 
And Third thing was for kids. It, right, and uh, different kinds of, uh, of programming that you can get. Um, and then the fourth is the interactive application uh, for retail. And in the retail application, you could get some advertising from different advertisers, in this case from someone who encoded it. Um, and then you will also get your traditional catalogs, um, but in this case they would be in interactive form. So the point here is getting the richness of real audio, real video, real TV style stuff with the interactive CPU control type thing I get right now online with my PC. Exactly. And then the final thing that I want to show is going back to the movies on demand, the video mm -hmm. on demand very quickly here, uh, the kind of interaction that you would have, for example, I would choose, uh, I would choose cartoons mm -hmm. to choose, any kind that I, I wanted. I would go to my particular favorite type of cartoon. I can go to any kind of episode. Uh, so I will choose the episode that I want. I can choose to buy or to rent immediately. Okay, so you're paying for these things now. This is sort of like Blockbuster coming in on the phone line. Absolutely. Okay. Um, and then while you're watching it, you also have VCR type controls. So I can pause this particular application. Uh, I can replay it when I want to. I can also fast forward and rewind it to whatever extent I want. And that's true video on demand. So really what I'm doing here is I'm controlling some server somewhere over there that's right. stopping my feed when I want it. So it's like a VCR, but I've got a sort of infinite number of sources there. Exactly. And the last point I want to make is it doesn't matter if it's a telco, cable, or wireless network. It's right. David doesn't care what the yeah. interface actually is. All right, Arthur, thank okay. you very much. You're welcome, Stuart. All right, digital TV is going to bring all kinds of new capability to your TV set. It, of course, is going to require sophisticated hardware and software to make it work. One of the leaders in this emerging field on the hardware side is Hewlett Packard, and Casey's with HP. Welcome, Casey. Thanks. All right, this is your version of a set-top box, and first of all, tell me how it's different from what we just saw from microwave. This is the Kayak system, and this is what we call a first-generation set-top box. It's a little bit more simple than what you saw from David, mm -hmm. and uh, it can do some simple things like an electronic program guide, which is basically your TV guide on the screen, and it lets you select programs, uh, program your VCR, mm -hmm. uh, find a show if in the 500 channels if you don't know where it is. Uh, it's also digital audio and video, so it's high quality kind of TV. It also lets you do some interactive play along games like Zing. Yeah. So this is basically a smarter cable box. I mean, I exactly. would get a box like this rented from my cable system, but now it's got all kinds of computer intelligence exactly. built into it. Yes. Now, you are not using David as an operating system, right? That's right. And the reason we're not is basically we don't need to do that at this point. Um, we're using a much simpler, much smaller operating system. Uh, that does everything we need it to do right now. All right, we hear these things are many years away and very expensive. Is that the case? Well, one of the reasons we've, we've gone with a simpler, smaller operating system is because we wanted to make this a product that could be available in the next year or so. And in fact, um, we do have orders for a million units. Uh, this product will be out mid-1996, mm -hmm. and we're working with all the major, or many of the major cable companies uh, to provide it for their subscribers. Okay, next you have a real cable modem sitting over here. Now, yeah. Earlier in the show we saw an example of using TV to feed lots of data. Tell me what a cable modem does. Well, a cable modem acts just like your modem today that you've hooked up to your PC and your phone lines. The difference is you'll hook this up to your cable line, your coaxial mm -hmm. cable line, and what you'll get is incredible speed. Uh, so the cable modem can perform at speeds that's up to a thousand times as fast as your 28.8 wow. modem today. Um, the other benefit of a cable modem is you're not using a phone line to do it, and you can actually watch cable TV while you're using your cable modem, so there's no conflict there. All right, and besides speed, what is the benefit of having a cable modem? I mean, as a consumer, what, what would I do with it other than what I do now with my modem? Well, one of the interesting things that's developing is because of the infrastructure behind the cable modem, you'll be able to get a lot of community-based services, so local services that you can't currently get on the internet mm -hmm. or online services. Examples would be um, being, a being able to call up your school, your kid's school, and find out what the homework assignment is or find out you know, how they're doing from their and teacher. And really pull down a video clip of my kid's teacher from that school. Exactly, saying you know, how well Sally's uh -huh. doing today mm. or this week. Um, you can do things like look up uh, local theaters, what's, what's the, uh, the local attraction at mm -hmm. the local theater, and buy tickets, pick your seat. Uh, you can do things that are very um, personally oriented, look up your horoscope, yeah. 
So once again, I mean, this is really convergence again. It's the power of TV, the power of the PC, bringing that control and the video stuff together. Yeah, absolutely. And it's interesting to note, some people have an opinion that the TV should be the interactive yeah. device and the P or the PC should be. And at HP, we really see a place for both the TV okay. and the PC. Thank you very much. All right, one of the grand experiments underway now to bring together TVs and PCs is taking place in Castro Valley, California where several hundred lucky PC owners can now download massive files via their TV cable using a new cable modem from Intel. At the Castro Valley High School near San Francisco, Jeff Goldstein's freshman class is studying geography. Of particular interest to the students here is the location of earthquake faults and their effect on different types of terrain. The students are using a high-speed internet connection to retrieve maps showing the risk of damage in different neighborhoods. The classroom is a test site for delivery of online services via broadband television cable. It's so tailored to the individual. It's tailored to the individual teacher, to the individual student, to the classroom. Um, that's, I would say, its, it's, most, it's most useful quality is that it's um, an incredibly rich resource. And um, you just can't access all that you need um, in one place right now unless you've got the technology in the classroom that I have. The Castro Valley area was chosen by Viacom Cable and Intel to measure the potential for PC cable, both at home and in the classroom. The school's internet link is always active, and the data is transmitted at fast broadband speeds, about 10 megabits per second. It might seem that a television monitor would do the job just as well, but Intel doesn't see it that way. But the reason we choose the PC over the TV is that basically personal computers were designed to be interactive, and they have the capability and the power to be interactive. Televisions were designed for a totally different purpose. Uh, they're in the wrong place. I mean, most people in the living room want to relax. And no matter how much computing power you put on top of a TV, you can't add more pixels to the screen. So you basically have a, a, a display which has very low resolution and may be great for watching television. It's wonderful for watching television. It's not very good for other things. But to the public school teacher, the future battle between PC and TV is a minor issue compared to the cost. All the teacher wants is more than one terminal for a class of 35 kids. For the Computer Chronicles, I'm Giles Bateman. Okay, so far we've looked at how you get computer intelligence into your TV and how to use your TV as a high-speed data path into your PC. Finally, let's look at convergence in the other direction, getting TV quality audio and video onto your personal computer. The technology is here now in the form of MPEG. Mike, you guys at S3 work on MPEG, and I wanted to see the differences. First of all, what we have running now is a video clip in what's called the AVI format. Explain AVI. Okay, um, this is uh, Knowledge Adventures that discovers, and they're using a proprietary video codec and it's really optimized for slower speed PCs, 386s and slow speed 486s. As you'll notice, there's uh, pixelation, blockiness, the frame rate is low, it's, uh, the audio quality is poor. It's not the same that we've come to expect from compact discs. And if we take a look at this next scene, which is coming here, we can see that's kind of crummy. But in fact, is this is what we would see right now if we were playing a game on a CD-ROM, right? I mean, basically, right. it's AVI. Right. Up till now, this has been considered good. But with the newer MPEG technology, we can really start to get TV quality and CD quality audio. All right. So what I want you to do is pull up the same video clip, only run it under the MPEG format now so we can see what the difference is between AVI and MPEG. Sure. So this will be the same piece of video. Right. It's the discovers, but now MPEG format. Now, right away, we can hear the audio is a lot better. Right, CD quality audio, and you start to see a lot more detail. There's no banding of the, the sky. There's a very uh, sharp detail around uh, uh, high contrast areas. MPEG is just a superior video codec. All right, now, why is the superior? What does MPEG have that AVI doesn't have? It, it builds in a, a superior algorithm. Uh, it does require more horsepower, but of course, today we have more horsepower on CPUs. And with low-cost hardware acceleration, like the chips that our company uh, mm -hmm. builds, we can now offer that at very low cost. And again, if we look at that sort of mountain scene again, which looks so crummy before, this is really crisp, looks like real video. Right? Exactly. All right, now, uh, this is MPEG-1 we're looking at? Right. This is MPEG-1. It's optimized for CD-ROMs. Uh, MPEG-2 will be the next generation standard optimized for broadcast video cable satellite type applications. Okay, quickly, I want you to go over to the other machine here and run... Uh, another video clip which really is going to show an example of not only the high quality 
video and audio we're getting out of MPEG, but the fact is that we also have that digital information to run the software, to run the program and to do branching and that kind of interactive stuff, right? Right. Here we're looking at Don Blue's uh, Dragon Slayer from ReadySoft, and it's an interactive game. It allows me to actually <coughs> play along, and depending on the, t uh, the path that I take, uh, well, here you I've died. just gotten killed, so I, I'm not the best uh, a video game player, but uh, as you can see, we can uh, branch along and, and really have a, a good time. And this is stuff that used to require a laser disc and arcade style uh, processing power. Now you're doing this on a PC. Exactly. With a CD ROM. And MPEG, in fact, is going to be standard in these new compact machines, right? Exactly. The 5500 and 9500 yeah. Presario models have MPEG standard. Mike, thank you very much. Thank you. All right, while we dream about cable modems and broad bandwidth, high speed data delivery systems, Right now, we have to be content with going online using our 28.8 .8 modem, if you're lucky. Our netmaster, Giles Bateman, has been surfing, slowly, for some convergence sites. Thanks, Stuart. Until I get my cable modem, I'll take 28.8 over 14.4 any day. Now, who knows exactly which standard will wind up being the interactive television standard, but these guys, Power TV, may have something to say about it. They're developing digital set-top terminal operating systems. And if you're not exactly sure what that mouthful of words means, you can come here and read a little bit more about it. Basically, they're going to be designing the operating systems that'll go in the set-top boxes that will give your television interactive television. You can come here and download also a white paper about their technology. Also interesting, I found this place called Da Vinci Time and Space. Now, these guys will be providing content programming uh, for children primarily, although I find it highly interesting. Maybe that says something. But uh, they will be providing content in the interactive medium. And they've designed interesting spaces. This is an example of an environment you might use to navigate around and learn stuff they're going to teach. Last but not least, we have ITNET. IT is IT, stands for Interactive Television. They're not doing interactive television yet, but you bet they want to. And they're going to be providing you uh, things. You can already come and download videos with audio. Uh, I've downloaded a clip from the, the recent Batman movie, and I'll leave you with that. Riddle me this, riddle me that. Who's afraid of the big black bats? <laughs> Now, time for our weekly summary of what's new in the field of personal computing. Let's go to Studio E for this week's computer news. In the random access file this week, get ready for Nashville. That's the Microsoft code name for Windows 96. According to InfoWorld, Microsoft has begun sending out non-disclosures to beta testers for the newest version of 32-bit Windows. No word on when Microsoft plans to launch Windows 96, though next year would be a good guess. Microsoft has announced price cuts on its home software line by as much as 45 percent. Prices dropped on more than 40 consumer titles. Microsoft calls the change an effort to attract new computer users, while analysts see it as evidence of increased competition in the crowded consumer software field. If you've been slowed down by the Windows 95 16-bit printing subsystem, Xenographics has announced a 32-bit printing utility to replace it. Called SuperPrint 4.0, the utility accelerates printing speed, smooths multitasking, and adds internet printing capabilities. Intel has conducted the first-ever demonstration of mobile personal conferencing using a Pentium laptop equipped with a cellular modem. Hello, Winston. Wave to the audience so they know that you are alive. That's very good. IBM has introduced two new models of its popular ThinkPad notebook computer. The new 760 series features a 12-inch color display, a new tilt-up keyboard, and a Pentium processor. The new notebook PCs also include an LCD display on the keyboard to give users a constant readout of battery life. Compaq has started shipping its new LTE 5000 notebook computer. The LTE is modular, allowing users to select which peripherals go into the expansion bays. You can insert either an extra hard drive, a CD-ROM player, or other peripherals. Hewlett Packard has introduced a new color printer, which doubles as a color copy machine. The new CopyJet color printer copier uses inkjet cartridges for 300 DPI color output. The CopyJet also features digital color imaging technology. The price will be around 2500 bucks. And finally, CompuServe will start carrying advertising beginning this month. The ads will be seen as selectable icons on online menus. Users will need to select the icon link to see what the sponsors have to say. That's it for this week's Random Access. Back to you, Stuart. Before we leave you, my pick of the week for a neat new computer product. Every once in a while, a piece of software comes out that lets you do something totally new. 
A new title from Delrina is in that category. It's called Echo Lake. What this software does is let you use your computer and its multimedia capabilities to build a new kind of family album. Up until now, you either pasted snapshots in a photo album or maybe you collected hours on end of home video. But now the PC is a platform for family memories. With Echo Lake, you can combine stories, graphics, photos, audio clips, even video clips in a really cool way. This is a great program that's fun to play with. It combines creativity with a real useful application. And it's one of the few computer programs that really gets the whole family working together on the home PC. It comes with an easy to use interface and memory joggers to help you dig back into your past. It's really a delightful program and one of the few pieces of software that both your kids and your parents will enjoy. It's called Echo Lake from Delrina and it's available for Windows and the Macintosh. That's it for this week's Computer Chronicles. We'll be back again next week with another look at the neatest new personal computer technology. I'm Stuart Chaffee. See you here next time.